We're wrapping up our little mini-series on the cross uh, this morning with a final installment on the cross and the essence of discipleship. As we get started, let's review for a minute. So we began uh, four weeks ago by looking at Old Testament foreshadowings of the cross. Can anybody remind us what were some of the things we saw in the Old Testament that pointed to the crucifixion of Christ? Yes, ma'am. The Passover, the Passover is ceremony, the Passover, the whole thing, especially the Passover lamb, uh, the, the killing of that, that lamb, uh, a one-year-old goat or lamb, uh, and then the application of the blood on the doorpost uh, pointed to the ultimate Passover, and 1 Corinthians 5 says that Christ, our Passover, has been slain. And uh, I, I think, uh, personally, I can't prove it, but I think uh, that Jesus Christ died at exactly the time that the Passover lamb would have been killed. I think that, that fits uh, the whole direction of the Bible. What else? Other Old Testament foreshadowings? Bronze the bronze serpent in the camp of the Israelites. Snakes were biting Is Israelis and they were dying and getting sick. God says to Moses, take a bronze snake, a model, wrap it around a pole, set it up in the middle of the camp. Whoever looks will live. Whoever looks in faith at that bronze snake and Jesus said to Nicodemus, and he said it to others too, uh, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. And at least on one occasion, the people immediately understood what he meant as in crucifixion. They, they understood that what he was talking about was his death. Uh, so what else? Can anybody think of some Old Testament passages that uh, have strong foreshadowings or looking ahead? Yes, ma'am. Um, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Uh, and, and Jesus uh, wasn't so much quoting that as he was saying it in the moment because God the Father had forsaken him. Right then, that's part of the punishment for sin. Uh, other passages that you think of? Jonah. Book of Jonah. As, as a, a sign is given, Jesus said, the sign of Jonah, three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the sea monster, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Isaiah 53 is another biggie. Huge, huge, uh, very, very important chapter. So important that it's hard to miss when you read that it just, it all points to Jesus Christ and specifically his uh, vicarious atonement. And then we talked about the events surrounding the crucifixion, the, the sequence of the trials in, in front of uh, Annas and Caiaphas, and then to Pilate, and then to Herod, and then back to Pilate, and finally he's handed over. Uh, we didn't really spend time on the, the physical uh, distress and tortures that were given to our Savior but they were significant. So uh, he had been up all night. He was short on sleep. Among the things they did, they pulled out his beard. Uh, they uh, jammed a crown of thorns on his head. They punched him in the face. Uh, ultimately, they, they laid the cross beam of the cross. It could weigh as much as 200 pounds. And they laid that on his shoulder and he was forced to carry it. He actually collapsed. Uh, and they had to get somebody else to carry the cross for him. So the events around the, the, the crucifixion are horrible. Uh, and of course, the greatest, most significant thing is when he's on the cross, the sky grew dark. It was dark for about three hours. And that period of time would seem to be the time when the sin of the world was laid on Jesus Christ. And God the Father was pouring out his anger on his own son for our, for our sin. And, and so the, the physical tortures were awful, the pain, the agony, the humiliation. But the real story of the crucifixion is Jesus bearing our sins and suffering in our place. That, that's really what it's about. Uh, and then remember that uh, 
at the temptation. So the Synoptic Gospels uh, all record the temptation of Jesus Christ in the, uh, after spending time in the wilderness by the devil. And among the temptations was the devil saying, see all these kingdoms? He shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. I think that that would include not just kingdoms that were then in, in effect. So that would be like the remnants of the Ptolemaic kingdom in, in Egypt. That would be the Roman Empire. That would be the Seleucids. That would be the remnants of, of empires all across the Middle East. It would also include China. China, one of the great civilizations of the world. But probably all the, all the civilizations that had existed and I think all the civilizations that would exist, the devil showed him all the marvelous empires and technologies and military might of, of humankind. And he said, this is yours if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus, of course, responded by saying, the scripture says, worship the Lord God and owe allegiance to him alone, nobody, nothing else. And when Jesus did that, it was not just a rebuttal of, of the devil's temptation. He was also sealing his doom. Why? I think that he could have accepted. He could have gone a different path to achieve the kingship. And he would have been, become king. I believe that the devil does have the authority to grant that because the Bible says that he's a, the prince of the power of the air and the god of this age. I think that he does have power under God to rule the world at some level, in some way. And so I think it was a legitimate offer uh, on the part of the devil to Jesus. And he would, have, he would have gone around the cross. He would have bypassed the suffering of the cross. What would that mean for you and me? Salvation would be impossible. Without the perfect sacrifice, without somebody who is righteous in God's eyes saying, punish me instead of them. Without that happening, we don't have salvation. So Jesus Christ would have been the king of the world forever and ever, but it would have been a doomed world, a world of human beings who were all of us, without respite, without escape, doomed for hell. And Jesus said, no, I will do it the, the, the way that the Father has ordained. I will do it the way that he said. Uh, we have great passages in Romans and in Galatians and in Colossians about the meaning of the cross for, for us believers. What are some of the things that the cross of Christ means for us who have trusted in Jesus? So this is something that we struggle with. I think we all probably struggle with it on pretty much a daily basis. I do not have to sin. I do not have to give in to temptation. And if I do, I don't have the luxury of saying, well, well I just had to. I, I was compelled to. I, I didn't have a choice. We don't have that luxury because actually we do have a choice. Slavery to sin has been abolished by the death of Christ. When he died, the, the compunction, the, the compulsion, uh, the slavery, the obligation to the sin principle has been eradicated. Now, if a child of God chooses to sin, that's exactly what it is. It is my choice. I choose to do that, but I don't have to. So it says in 1 Corinthians that with every temptation, God has also made a way of escape. There is always a way out of sin. There is never a, a situation in which I have to sin. That's not true. Uh, so Jesus destroyed the, the compulsion to sin, the slavery to sin that's gone, and uh, it has been defeated. The, the power of the old flesh nature 
has been defeated. Uh, do you know what, uh, in evolutionary th uh, theory, do you know what a vestigial organ is? They use that terminology sometimes. Do you know what a vestigial organ is? When no longer exists, they have no purpose. No purpose. So for years and years and years, in high school and college biology textbooks, it would uh, illustrate this with uh, the coccyx and the appendix. There are others too, but those are two of the biggies. So what is the coccyx? That's your tailbone. And evolution say it's a holdover from when we were primates with tails. And we used to have tails and uh, you know we've, we've grown out of it over the last couple hundred million years or whatever. And now it's just kind of a leftover. It's the last little bit of a tail. But it's not, it doesn't serve any purpose. That is patently false. The coccyx is a, uh, an attachment point for a lot of muscles, a lot of muscles that, that are important for walking and, and other things. And if you didn't have that attachment point, your bodily function would be much, much less. How about the, the appendix? It's part of the immune system. It, it's very important. And, and people who have their appendix removed uh, actually have a lowered immune uh, response, and so on. So vestigial is this. It's leftover remains that serve no purpose, that, that aren't really effective. So think about it like this. Uh, vestigial organs are a myth. God did not create human beings with organs or parts of our body that have no function. Everything that he designed in us is functional and purposeful. But in our relationship to sin, the flesh nature, the old nature, the, the propensity to sin has no power. It has no ability to force it, to, to force us into sin it's just a vestigial remains. The old nature is just the leftovers of what used to be there, but it doesn't actually have any operational control. Only what we give it. Only what we allow it to have in our lives. So, you know, we don't have to sin. We are, we are never under compulsion to sin. Now, we, we use terminology like, oh, I just had to, or the devil made me do it. Those are cop-outs. Those are excuses. It's not true. We, did not, we do not have to sin, and the devil does not have any power to make any Christian do anything. So Christ defeated the flesh. He defeated the sin nature. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the world... How does the world look at our discussion of and our love of the doctrine of the cross of Christ? What do they say about that? They ridicule us. They, ridicule us. they think it's crazy. They, they think it's foolish. They think that what we're doing here right now is absolutely bizarre. Uh, if they give it any thought at all, which is relatively rare, what they think about us is, you people are so weird. Why would you waste a perfectly good, beautiful, sunshiny morning sitting in a room listening to somebody drone on? So they think that this is foolishness. The, the word of the cross, the message of the cross, is to the world foolishness. But to those of us who have put our faith in Jesus as Savior, what do we think about the cross? It's the power of God. We say, this is exciting. I love to talk about the cross. It saved my life. It has given me hope. I'm going to heaven. Uh, it changed everything about me. Uh, everything good that I have is because of the cross of Christ. Every hope that I have for the future is because of the cross. And so for, uh, for us, <clears throat> we can't get enough of it. We love to talk about the, the cross of Christ. And Alana does too. Uh, and and we, we love this, but the world thinks it's crazy. 
And then finally, we discussed previously the peace of the cross between Jews and Gentiles, Ephesians 2, and then between sinful man and holy God. We have been reconciled. Uh, we have been brought to the peace table, and reconciliation normally involves two parties, each of which compromise in some way to arrive at a peace treaty. That's not exactly biblical reconciliation. Why not? It was all God. God is the one who brought us to him. He can't change. God can't change who he is or his legal position because he's perfect. And so if he were to change, what would that look like? It would be imperfect. And he can't do that. So the, the solution to this problem is he changed us. He brought us to himself. He did all the work. He reached out and he said, I'm going to reconcile you sinners to myself. And the cross is what did that. The cross uh, is the mechanism by which we are reconciled to God. Now, finally this morning, we're in Luke chapter 9, and we're looking at a passage that has not so much to do with salvation or atonement, uh, or redemption as it does with discipleship. And so I have printed out the text for you. You can look at it there or in your own Bible as you care to. Luke chapter 9 and starting at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So in the context immediately preceding is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And then uh, here uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And uh, part of the context here is, is Peter's confession of Christ. Uh, Jesus says, who do the crowd say that I am? And, and the, the apostles say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist resurrected other prophets. And uh, uh, Jesus says to them, to the 12, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, acting as spokesman, says, you are the Christ of God, the Christ of the, uh, the Son of the living God. And so this is called Peter's confession of Christ. And in, in Matthew chapter 16, we have Jesus' response to that, which is, he, he says, I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And, and that's the first occurrence of a, a prophecy or a statement about the, the coming organism of the church. That, that's in the Matthew context. Here, Luke doesn't address that, but he does go on to say, so Jesus is teaching his apostles, and he's talking to them about important things, and he's talking uh, about discipleship. And so he's going to have uh, some, some statements about what it means to follow him, to come after him. And here's what they are. In verse 23, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So in that verse, we have three statements that we're going to examine. Uh, and then after that verse, we have three more explanatory statements. And you can see that because Jesus uses the word for uh, in the next verse, for whoever wishes, and then in the next verse, for what is a man profited, and finally, for whoever is ashamed. So those fours function as explanations. It's, it's almost like he gets out uh, a magnifying glass, and he says, let me, let me uh, uh, show you in greater detail what I mean by this. So he shows us one thing, and then he says, let me show you more detail. So it's kind of like increasing the power on your telescope or microscope. You're looking in, in greater depth at something in each one of those statements. 
So there are three requirements for following Jesus that we see here. First of all, uh, someone must deny himself. What does that mean exactly? Well, the word deny simply means deny, uh, to say no to, to say no you can't. What does it mean to deny himself? Do you think that, that the Lord Jesus wants us to never ever have another bowl of ice cream? Would that be denying oneself? No, uh, I, I mean, Jesus uh, seemed to encourage people to enjoy aspects of life. Uh, asceticism is a, a strange idea that, that says the more you uh, torture yourself or the more that you deny um, food, water, sleep, proper clothing, whatever, the holier you get. Uh, this is the philosophy that lies behind a lot of Roman Catholic heresy pertaining to monks who would go and live in a cell somewhere for uh, years and years and years and drink water and eat bread. And they would be emaciated and thin and they'd have diseases and so on. And they think they're getting holier. The Bible doesn't say anything about that at all. In fact, it says the opposite. Uh, you should be a good steward of what God has given you, including your body. Try to take care of it. Uh, so that's not it. What does it mean? Deny yourself. Deny himself. What's it? Do not sin. To not sin. Certainly not uh, give in to sin as we've just discussed. Let us see another hand. Yeah. Yeah. So to deny uh, oneself, um, goals, dreams, desires, objectives, we all have things we'd like to do, things that we'd like to accomplish, things that we want. But to deny yourself is to take all of those things and instead of having them be at the top of the sheet of paper, we move them down. And we say, more than what I want, I want what God wants for me. I take what I want and I put it down the list and I say, I'm giving that to God and what I want more than my goals, my dreams, my aspirations, what I want is what God wants. Can you think of an example of somebody in the Bible who did exactly that? Joseph, okay, very good, Joseph. Moses, probably, to some extent. There'd be a lot of them. I think probably the greatest example of all is somebody who was in a garden and was praying, and he had something that he didn't want to do, but he knew that God the Father wanted him to do it. And so you know who this is. He prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from, what's the cup? Crucifixion. Let this cup pass from me. And then here's the kicker, of course. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What was Jesus doing? Denying himself. He was saying, I don't really want to do this but I'm putting my will down the list and I'm putting your will at the top of the list. That's self-denial. Now, uh, think about it like this. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, Christians in thinking about following the Lord and being committed and being a disciple of the Lord Jesus, sometimes we can generate kind of a, a, a martyr's complex. Uh, do you know what that is? You know what a, a, a martyr complex is? It's kind of self-pity and, and kind of feeling bad for ourselves and saying, this is kind of a hard thing and, and it's kind of sad, but I'm gonna do it because I know it's the right thing to do. And, and 
It's really hard, and nobody understands how hard it is, but I got to do it. And <laughs> so here's another way of looking at this. Um, the Lord Jesus talked about rewards, about, uh, he used parables quite frequently, and he talked about uh, people who would give up everything to do what the master told them to do. So uh, on one occasion he told a parable and uh, he says, this is what you got to do. You, you, you do what the master tells you to do. And then when the master comes back from a trip, he calls you into account and he says, well done. You've done a good job. I've got something for you. And uh, Peter, in responding to this teaching, said, Lord, what about us? Uh, we have given up everything to follow you. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? There is nobody who has given up anything to follow the Son of Man who will not receive many times as much mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, and a bunch of other things too in the kingdom of God. So the reward far, far outweighs any temporary small deprivation or denial that we might experience ourselves. Here's another way of looking at it, and this too is found, uh, the book of Colossians uses the word ful uh, fulfill or fill several times, talking about the fullness of Christ, talking about the fullness of following the Lord, uh, fulfillment in the Christian life, <clears throat> so I can relate to this aspect of it uh, by means of my own personal experience. So you all know that my dad was a preacher and a seminary professor, and I thought from a relatively young age that probably I would end up being a preacher and a pastor too. But I wasn't sure. I wasn't settled on that. And I went through a period of time in high school thinking about other things I'd like to do. I won't tell you what they are because in retrospect they seem a little silly now. But, but I had things that I thought I might like to do. And uh, in college, I attended University of Michigan and then the Lord opened the door for me to attend uh, Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary simultaneously as a special student. Uh, so I began taking classes there too and it was during that time that I was dating Lori. Uh, I was in Michigan, she was in New York, and I was calling out to God for direction, asking him, give me clarity, what am I supposed to do in my life? I thought probably I should be a preacher, but I didn't want to go into a relationship with Lori saying, uh, we're gonna be poor as church mice because we're gonna be church mice. <laughs> Uh, and then changing my, my, my mind down the road, uh, I had an opportunity to become a teaching fellow at another university in an English department. Uh, my professors thought I was pretty good at English and they were, they, they were making arrangements for that if I wanted. So I, I was asking God, give me clarity. What, what am I supposed to do? And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I like baseball. I played a lot of baseball in my youth. I love that. I like writing. I like um, working with my hands and, and working with wood. Um, I like those things, but I'm willing to give it all up. I'm willing to deny myself and set all that aside, give it all to God and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Uh, and I did. I said to God, I give everything to you, you just tell me what you want to do. So I continued my training. I, I finished up my college degree. I trained under my dad and under my brother. I became a pastor. And the first church that Lori and I were called to was the Waterville Baptist Church in Waterville, New York, little teeny tiny village near Utica, New York. And uh, <laughs> After a couple of years there, some guys in the church said, hey, what do you think about doing like a softball team? There's a few other churches around here. 
that we could, we could play, we could start a softball league and we could play softball with, with other church guys from four, five, six other churches. I said, okay, that, that'd be fun. So we, we started a softball league. I played softball for my church team for several, I don't know, three, four, five years. Somewhere along the line, I preached a message and I said, I put a lot of work into that. That I think that's quality material. I wonder if I could get somebody to transfer. We, we had a cassette record, recorder system. And so uh, I took the cassette of that message to a transcription service in downtown Utica, New York. These are the people that would transcribe like medical doctor's notes or lawyers, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I handed it to them and I said, could you transcribe this? And they said, sure, you know, it's, I forget now, $25 an hour or whatever. And a week later I went and picked it up. I said, would you do it again? And they said, we'll talk. We've never heard so, so fast uh, talking. <laughs> In other words, I, I got my money's worth out of that hour-long tape. <laughs> that became a little pamphlet uh, based on Ephesians 5.1. Uh, I was writing for a church. And then along the way, uh, the Lord opened the door for me to get a couple of tools and to make stuff to help out church, to make stuff to help out my family. You know what God did? God gave me everything I ever wanted. When I denied myself and said, you're in charge, you take over, I want what you want. Interesting concept, isn't it? Now, I'm not saying that every Christian always gets everything that's in his dreams, but I am saying that fulfillment and joy come when we put God first. When we deny ourselves and we say, I'm going to, be in, I'm going to get in the back seat, and I want God to be in the driver's seat. I want him to be in charge. I will say no to what I want and yes to what he wants. And when we do that, there is fulfillment, satisfaction, purpose, joy. So, deny himself. And then it says, take up his cross daily. Uh, there's, there's misunderstanding about this phrasing. A lot of people say, well, your cross is some burden that you have to bear. For some people, uh, maybe it's... Uh, emphysema and for some people maybe it's uh, you know a husband or a wife who's not saved for some people it might be a, a job that you don't really like uh, I don't think that's really what Jesus has in mind when he says take up your cross daily uh, the cross crucifixion was known before the Roman period other other civilizations practice crucifixion but the Romans were the ones who turned it into a fine art. And crucifixion is the, the most, uh, one of the most horrific ways to kill somebody. It's designed to publicly humiliate as well as to, you know, it sends a message. It sends a political message. We're in charge and we can do anything, you want, anything we want with you, so stay out of our way and to identify with Jesus. Just think about who is at the cross. You had a lot of scoffers, a lot of people ridiculing him. You did have some women who were standing close by and weeping. At least John was somewhere nearby. Most of the other disciples had gone away. Uh, who identified with Jesus? Well, the women and maybe John. Peter is somewhere else. To pick up one's cross is to identify with Jesus Christ in an unashamed way. To, to publicly say, 
I'm a Christian. Maybe you've been in a, in a scenario, uh, you know, some kind of a setting where people are, are being kind of raucous and loud and laughing and somehow or other the subject of Christianity or Jesus Christ or Christians comes up. And in that setting, it would be very, very embarrassing to admit, I'm a Christian. It would be kind of a shameful thing to say, those people that you're laughing at, those people that you think are stupid, I'm one of them. But that's what this is. It is an identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's saying, he carried his cross, I'm carrying my cross too. So I, I don't think it's necessarily a health condition or a, a, a financial situation or, I don't think that's necessarily what Jesus is getting at. What he's getting at is, identify with me. Identifying with Jesus Christ. And then, finally, Follow me, he says. What's involved in following me? Well, at least this much, to follow somebody is to imitate. It's to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy. Uh, does, does public school teach handwriting anymore? No? They don't, they don't do that anymore. I'm, no, okay. E even like, they must do printing. This point, but no cursive, yeah. Well, I think probably most everybody here is old enough to remember uh, going to school and the teacher shows you on the chalkboard and then those, those uh, sheets with printed lines on them and you have to, you know, you do this and so on. You taught that, right, Jeannie? Yeah, I mean, that, so you imitate what the teacher is showing. The teacher shows you, this is how you make an A, you do it like this. And then you practice, you do it like this. And, and, you know, the way that I, I was taught, you, you hold your pen or pencil like this. I've seen people do it like, like that or something. I could never figure that out. I've even seen somebody hold it like that. How do you, how do you write like that? But, well, you, you copy what the teacher shows you, you know. Well, that's imitation. And so the Lord Jesus shows us this is how you do it. In the morning service, in a couple of minutes, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 8 at Jesus and at how he handled an interruption in his schedule. Well, that should be a pattern that's a template for how we handle interruptions in our lives. We see what he does, we see how he responds, and then we say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. We imitate him. Not only that, but we learn. This word disciple means a learner, a pupil. And the Christian life is a lot about being a classroom. We're studying, and what is it that we're studying? We're studying Jesus so that we know what life is about, what life is for. We, we understand this is how you handle problems that come up. And following the Lord Jesus would also involve obedience. When he says, this is what I want you to do. We don't argue with them. We don't complain. We don't groan. We don't develop a martyr's complex. We just say, okay. Uh, you know, in, in the home that I was raised in, uh, we were taught that when dad and mom said something to do, we weren't allowed to complain about it. We weren't allowed to groan about it. We weren't allowed to argue. The, the right response was, okay or yes. <laughs> uh, if, if the response was no, well, there would be consequences. Uh, I remember, uh, I won't give any names or anything like that, but siblings of mine, certainly not me, <laughs> received uh, uh, corporal punishment for saying no, or for arguing, or for complaining. Well, the Lord Jesus has the right to tell us, I want you to do this. And the right response to that as a follower of Christ is, okay, I'm on it right now. So uh, the Christian life is a, is a life of discipleship, of following the Lord Jesus. And it consists of these things, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him.
Questions or comments as we shut down? Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of our Savior, for the work that he did on the cross that has changed everything about our lives from hopelessness to hope, uh, from gloom to joy, uh, from sorrow to happiness. And Father, we pray that we would simply follow in our Savior's footsteps and be like him. So help us, we pray, to truly be disciples of the Lord Jesus. Now bless the morning service and the remainder of our day together. In Jesus' name, amen.